Your Excellency, Dame Paulette Louisi, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dame Paulette Louisi, Dr. Merle St. Clair Auguste, Vice Principal, Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, partners, OECS representatives, Flow representatives, Valeri representatives, St. Lucia Distillers, Menage Trois, members of management, faculty and staff of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, students, specially invited guests, live streamers, welcome. Welcome to our third lecture series at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, Uprising, the Illumination Lecture Series. This evening, our lecture is entitled, Queola Pa Bata, the St. Lucian language situation and the use of Kewal in the classroom. My name is Tracy Pilgrim George, and it is a pleasure to be your host this evening. At this point in time, I would like to welcome the chair of the Illumination Committee, Mr. Vladimir Lucier, with the opening remarks. Good evening, everybody. Um, protocol having been established, welcome again to our third lecture. Um, I, I'm giving yet another background, I think, at the third lecture for the third consecutive time, but I think it's important. Our audience has been growing both in-house and online, and um, I think it's important that we re-emphasize each time what, what, what we're trying to do here. Um, and I'm thinking of it now in context of the society which these lectures were um, created to reach out to and to, to reach out for. Um, I'm thinking of the present where over the last years we've, the last year or so, we've, we've as we say, we've had a kind of um, Mr. Basile passing through St. Lucia where quite a few of our cultural icons have left us. Um, Gandalf Sinclair, Derek Walcott, um, Lebo recently, Francis Lebo de Lima, and um, Teresa Hall, many people, and I remember on the day that I found out that the FRC burnt, it felt like a death to me as well. But I think a philosophy of my own life is that nothing appears without its opposite. And I think in the midst of all of that happening, there are auguries and omens of rising up from what has taken place. And I think this is perhaps a small, perhaps a big, but a pivotal part of the rising up to do the kind of work that was being done by those that have left, and to take what they have done and to extend on it, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and that's the context within which I want us to start to talk about what this lecture series is about. Uh, my comments will be brief, but that is the, that is the society, and that is where we're operating within. Um, before I get to the lecture, I just want to acknowledge that while this lecture has grown, it has continued to attract and to, and to, 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 to somehow, to somehow create another create for the, the generosity of the solution community. community. So the solution so community has really, really reached out to us and, 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 and helped us in standing tall and, and continuing what we've been doing. doing. After each After lecture, each we've, lecture we've, we've had interest, had interest um, um, including from people who have presented and who have lent, have lent a hand to us in very, very substantial ways. So our partners, I thank you very much for acknowledging you throughout because it would not be possible without you. Um, um, our most our recent reason of being Menager to our wine and solution distillers, distillers and we'd like to thank you for coming on board with us, as well as our sponsors who have been with us from the very beginning, Flo, OECS, Tracy, don't forget, and Valeria, right? So we want to thank you. So briefly, hopefully, this lecture was started from the Vice Principal's Office at South Carolina Community College, coming out of it. For, for a discourse between, between this, institution, this institution, which is which supposed is to be playing a particular role in the society, um, um, being what it is, is and, and being what it is, what it is as, an as an institution, but also as the kind of institution it's supposed to represent, represent who is named after what it has done in the past and what we want to continue doing. doing. Um, 
um, uh, to the whole post post extend the hand, hand, not the extend the hand, 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 but the bridge, bridge, bridge the community, as I've said before, and to have two-way two traffic, traffic on that bridge, that, bridge, that the community has something to offer, and the rest definitely has something to offer the society. And these and lectures, lectures at, at, the at the beginning, the beginning as been, so I thought so the lecturers were so doing remarkable, remarkable work. work. And, and who have, who have been, wanting been wanting for an outlet as well, um, uh, getting the opportunity to, to uh, you know, share their work, and no better way of sharing it than with their own society, first and foremost. What is also very important about that, and very important about this lecture series in regards to what I started out talking about, is that we have managed to garner quite a substantial online following. Um, every lecture that has taken place, we have had really surprising numbers in terms of our live streams, and people have also followed it after the lecture um, because they are able to access the video via our, our website, slcctv.org. So that also starts to tell us a little bit about the future. Um, we lost FRC, we lost our archives, but we haven't lost the minds that have created these things. We haven't lost the, the persons they taught. We haven't lost the society they impacted. And from that society, we are going to extend what has been done. We are going to be a part of what they've done. We're going to help in the revivification of, of, of what was there. And online is a great place to do so. So I'm very happy about that aspect of the lecture, that it has established for itself quite quickly a, a, a rooted online presence. Um, so that we're not just here, those of us who are sitting in this room, but we're accompanied by, what, from what I've seen in the last lecture, hundreds of persons um, online. So the hope is that we create a positive uprising, that the uprising we create is not the one that destroys society, but one that lifts it up. And that is the hope of this lecture. And that is what has come for the last two lectures that we've had. They've been remarkable. Um, Dr. Winston Fulgens, Mr. Ron John Baptist, they were very, very, very good lectures. Very uh, riveting lectures. I was there for both and hopefully all of you were here too. Um, so this third one will be no less. I have very, I have great confidence in the person who's in the very next, um, Dr. Kathy Depardy. So without further ado, let me, let me move to the next thing of the program and get off the stage. But thank you very much for coming. And please continue to come. Please follow us. Look, uh, check out our website, slccc.org, slcctv.org, sorry. And continue to follow the movement of, of uprising and the illumination series generally. Okay, thank you, welcome, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mr. Lucien, and as he remember, as he just mentioned, SALCC keeps up rising. We keep moving forward. We are now offering, as he mentioned, SALCC TV, and SALC, SALCC TV. At this point in time, we now have remarks by Mrs. Surging John Baptiste, representing one of our partners, Saint Lucia Distillers, Menage Trois Wines. and adopted the protocol that has already been established. Good evening, everyone. And uh, let me, at this time, thank SALCC for allowing St. Richard Stillers Bobby Limited the opportunity of partnering on the Uprising Innovation Series. I think from being at the last one where my husband was actually presenting, um, it definitely opened my eyes to the different facets of the college and the information that is disseminated through organizations and um, lectures such as this to the wider public. I think it's very, very important. And actually sitting in and being a part of the conversation, because it was just that, it was not just a lecture, but it was a conversation had by persons online as well as persons in the room about what was being um, lectured on, um, I think is important for the wider community. And it was important for me as a representative of my organization uh, to be a part and to lend support to this initiative because we take it very serious in assisting the community in different ways. And this is a very, very important way of starting that conversation. The diversity of topics that are actually being uh, brought forth through these series is important. And for us as, as an organization, as an indigenous company, um, it's, it's, it's just one of our very important pillars to be 
be able to assist society and initiatives such as this. So for us, this is a small way of giving back, but to SALCC, I say bravo for an initiative such as this, and we will continue to assist and to build on this partnership that we have begun um, with this lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your collaboration. It seems that the word for tonight is indigenous. I like that word. Indigenous businesses supporting us, indigenous education, indigenous lecturers, indigenous language. At this point in time, I would like to welcome Ms. Epifana Lewis, lecturer from the Division of Technical Educational Education and Management Studies, to introduce our feature lecturer, Dr. Kathy Deborah. Good evening. Dr. Kathy Devlin has been a teacher um, for the last 20 years. She spent the first half of her teaching career attached to the Cicero Combined School and has been a lecturer of language and linguistics at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College for the past 10 years. Dr. Devlin is very passionate about language learning and teaching in real vernacular contexts such as that which, is, which exists sorry, in the former British territories of the Eastern Caribbean and also with equipping teachers of language arts with the necessary skills to function effectively in these contexts. She holds a Bachelor of Arts and a PhD in Linguistics from both the University of the West Indies. Dr. Devlin is currently the head of the N80 mission team and a member of the planning committee for the St. Lucia Language Policy and Instruction Conference held in 2017. She has taught a range of language courses within the SALCC certificate and associate degree programs. The JBTE associate degree program and the SALCC UWI Bachelor of Education program. Dr. Deppelin has also served as a master teacher for the Peace Corps pre-service training in 2017. She is a member of both the Linguistic Society of America and the Society of Caribbean Linguistics and has presented on the following papers at various forums. The Language Instruction in St. Lucia, Creole and Literacy, the vernacular instruction and the development of literacy, and an alternative, sorry, for language instruction in St. Lucia, and the language education in Creole and vernacular contexts. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Ms. Dr. Kathy Deprecate. Thank you so Thank much, Ms. So Swiss. Swiss. Merci, Merci Most Question Troisième question. Qui m'en est exactement teacher supposé estui en couleur? Good evening to our in-house and online audience. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Tonight we will have a frank conversation about the value of Quayo. To guide this conversation, we will focus on three areas. Saint Lucia, the first, St. Lucia's language situation. The second, the benefits to be derived from including Quayo 
as part of a bilingual approach to language instruction. And the third question, how exactly we will approach bilingual instruction in the classroom. St. Lucia can be, or is considered to be, a bilingual country with English and a French Creole as the main languages spoken by the population of the country. However, this um, description is not as simple as just people speaking two languages. This diagram here, which is the work of Dr. Martha Isaac, who is here with us tonight, really gives an idea of the breakdown of the languages that we speak. If you look at this diagram, you will notice that she categorizes our speech as being, you see the SLFC there, which refers to St. Lucian French Creole, and SLE, which refers to St. Lucian English. The St. Lucian English comprises an acrolectal variety, which is St. Lucian Standard English. Now, by acrolectal, we refer to that variety of English which is used in formal situations or is the language of formal contexts. We have, she identifies a mesolectal variety, which is an intermediate English variety, and a basilectal variety, St. Lucian Basilect. What I really want to draw to your attention in this diagram is that at each area of the diagram, you will notice, if you look at the shading, sorry, you will notice some sort of overlap between each of the areas. What this really means is that when we look at language competence of our solutions, it, it, we we have a range of competence, in other words. So there are some individuals who, for example, who may speak French Creole and also have um, competence in the basilectal variety. Now, the basilectal variety would be the language of individuals who are pure French Creole speakers but have had some exposure to English and in their attempts to produce English would um, produce this code or use this code which is which has a heavy reliance on a lot of ca um, the characteristics of a pure French crew. Now, when I refer to or when I say that these are the languages that solutions speak. Let me bring now bring in the term mother tongue or first language. Your mother tongue or first language, and again, I remember something from Dr. Isaac, a class that I had many moons ago with Dr. Isaac, and she introduced this video to us, the language you cry in. And that has stayed with me from 2005, I believe. Never forgot it. Your first language or mother tongue is that language through which you express your deepest emotions. Lovely play away. Lovely do a moon, 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 and for some of us, that language is standard English. Good? So <laughs> what? Wait. Apart from Dr. Isaac's um, description of our language situation, Simmons MacDonald offers an assessment of our linguistic situation also. She does so, however, with specific reference to the unique composition of learners in a typical St. Lucian classroom, which can be considered to be a microcosm of the wider St. Lucian community. According to her, 
in the early years of primary school, particularly in rural areas. Classroom composition consists of learners who speak well, vernacular English, which is a Creole, that Creole-influenced variety, and the St. Lucian Standard English as first languages. She also makes the point that those children who live in urban areas are also likely to possess one or more of the three codes when they first enter school, although it is likely that these students will have greater competence in St. Lucian Standard English or in the Creole, the Creole influence variety, which is oh, the Creole influence variety. These assessments and others which describe the current peculiarities of the language situation in St. Lucia are in keeping with the observations of researchers such as Mervyn Ali, whom we lost recently, uh, which were made 25 years before Dr. Isaacs, um, before Dr. Isaac described our language situation. At that time, Aline had noticed the emergence of a new language variety and described it as a distinctive English vernacular which is strongly influenced by Creole phonetic, semantic, and syntactical patterns. Phonetic being the sound system of quail, semantic referring to the meanings attached to quail words, and the syntactical patterns referring to the grammar of quail. This observation suggested suggests a marked difference from the data presented in the 1946 census, which did not that did not indicate the existence of a vernacular in the country. Now just let me pause here for a bit. The term vernacular is used by linguists to refer to the popular speech of a people. So at one point in St. Lucia, our vernacular would have been quail. But again, owing to the dynamism of language, that has changed. Thus, you find that researchers often make reference to current trends which indicate that the Creole-influenced vernacular is gradually displacing Creole as the language of the general population. This new variety, although it is considered by many to be English, differs from it significantly on syntactic and semantic levels. Neither does the presence of caps on French Creole make it a Creole. So something interesting is happening here. It isn't English, but is it really, a, can we really call it a Creole variety? We'll answer those questions as we, we move along. Um, I just want to point out a few things to you. This English Creole variety, this variety, Creolized or English Creole variety has been, based on the sources that you look through, you will see referred to by different names. Some linguists refer to it as St. Lucian English Creole. Some, well, particularly Paul Garrett, the vernacular English of St. Lucia, Bissell. The St. Lucian English vernacular, or SLEV, which is Professor Simmons McDonald's designation, and St. Lucian Creole English. All of those terms basically refer to the same code. But um, individuals will choose to use a particular code for specific reasons, a particular name, sorry, for specific reasons. Garrett, for example, calls this, as I said, a Creole influence variety. Um, so he calls it the vernacular English of St. Lucia. It is his position that although this language variety bears many non-standard features, which are also common in Caribbean Creole languages, it differs from them not only in terms of its socio-historical origins, but also because its features reflect, again, phonological, semantic, and syntactic influences of Creole. The genesis is thought to be Creole. It has also been suggested that the, the emergence of this language variety 
is rooted in learners' attempts at producing standard English. For example, Garrett argues that the, that, that the genesis of the vernacular can be attributed to monolingual speakers of Quail who had limited access to English, passing on their heavily Quail influenced English as a second language to their children, whose access to English was otherwise almost as limited in many cases as it had been for their, as had been for their parents. It must be recognized that the existence of the vernacular, and I'm going to use a nomenclature, slev, also underscores that St. Lucia, like most of the English-speaking Caribbean, is also defined by the existence of a bidialectal situation. Now, this is where it gets a little tippish. We have a bilingual situation because of the existence of Creole and English, because within that, we also have a bidialectal situation. And I'll explain. A ling linguist use the term dialect to refer to or to mean a variety of a language. That is different from the everyday use of the term where individuals use dialect to refer to oral language. Right? You sometimes have people say, oh, she's speaking dialect. When we use the term, we use it um, very differently. Now, a bidialectal situation um, exists when the natural language of children differs from the standard language aimed at in schools, but is at the same time sufficiently related to the standard language for there to be some amount of overlap at the level of vocabulary and grammar. So for that reason, some people would consider that the English variety, the Lucian English variety, said the vernacular variety to be of, like a dialect of English because of those similarities. So hence why I would say we have this bilingual situation coexisting with a bidialectal situation. So think of our children. Just let that sink in a bit. They either have this as their first language or the language they think in automatically, the language which that, that they're able to express themselves in without a second thought, the language that they can have continuous discourse in is either queer, the solution English um, vernacular. However, when we, they get into the classroom, we say to them, those languages which you know, those languages which allow you to express yourself, we do not want to hear them. You now have, you now have to function in standard English. And you have to function almost immediately by displaying literacy skills in standard English. Now, on the basis of that, it is my position, and I say it again, my position as in Kathy Deberlin's position, that what exists in solution classrooms is a second language learning situation. And it is because whether, okay, if I go there, let's talk about the distinction between acquisition and learning. When we speak of language acquisition, that refers to the incidental process of internalizing a language. That incidental process, which does not require you to focus on form or grammar, that incidental process, which only requires that you focus on meaning, that is acquisition. As opposed to learning, which is the deliberate study of a language with deliberate focus on form, deliberate emphasis on learning structure or grammar. 
And if you think of the, the context in which those two processes occur, acquisition occurs in an informal context, when language learning occurs in formal context, one of which is the classroom. Hence, and that, that has to happen. Oh. Um, yeah, so going back to my point about language learning. We have a language learning situation in, in St. Lucia because whether a child comes in as a first language speaker of Queo or a first language speaker of the St. Lucia English vernacular, that child, in order to gain competence in standard English, will have to engage in the deliberate study of the structure of standard English in order to become competent in that variety. We cannot escape that. Now, apart from the unique language situation, we are presented with another situation which demands that a change in instruction is necessary. A perusal of local examination results, such as the results of the language arts sections of the national assessment examinations or even common entrance, will point to the inability of many infant and primary school students to retain satisfactory marks on components of these examinations, such as main idea and expressive writing. Now this was, as you would have heard earlier, I started off as a primary school teacher. It was during that period of my career that I was afforded the opportunity to participate in the, the grading of national examinations. And what I noticed over the years was this. When students had to um, complete the sections of the language arts exam, which required them to break down language into parts, separate skills or separate areas, such as vocabulary, spelling, sentence structure. Their scores were very high. Those are the sections out of 10. However, when they were required to use language holistically in expressive writing, or even to express the main idea of a uh, a passage, that is when we, that is when we see problems. So there's this sort of disconnect. Additionally, I'd like you to take a look at this diagram. The, Nash, the what was formerly the minimum standards examinations, now the national assessment examinations. What I have here um, are the means in language arts for grade two students between 2003, well, from 2003 to 2013. And on the other side, the, the means in language arts for the grade four students. Now, we know that the students write the minimum standards national assessment exams in grade two and two years later in grade four. What I want to point out is that the national means of what would have been, so for example, I have just named, I've named the cohorts um, A through K. What should technically be the very same cohort two years later, if we look at cohort A, the mean in 2000, the national mean in 2003 was 52.20. The national mean in 2005, 50.55. And as you go down the line, you will notice the means for each cohort of students two years later is lower than the mean when the students were in grade two. What we have coming out of this data is that the students are not performing as they were in grade two. This is cause for concern 
because it has been argued that problems with language arts learning which emerge in the primary school may worsen as learners progress through the school system. I think we should be a little concerned or even more concerned because there is research on St. Lucia by Winch and Gingo which suggests that there may be a possible relationship between the maturation of St. Lucian language learners and an increase in errors in English sentence production even for those academically able learners who gain entry into secondary school. a little further and look at our CXC reports, CXC reports on, on the English A examinations. From the 2011 report, it is clear that hundreds of students across the Caribbean have not mastered the use of standard English and that there continues to be interference from dialects and patois used throughout the region. That report goes on to say, for students who almost abhor reading, some methods must be found to encourage the correct use of language. From the June 2013 report, there is a tendency of students to express themselves in essay type questions using the vernacular of their countries of origin. From the 2015 report, candidates had challenges with mastering syntax or the grammar of standard English and to, ex and to express themselves clearly. What I want you to note is that by the time students have written the CSEC examination, There would have been in a school system for a period of 12 years. 12 years studying English. Allow that to sink in. Mais c'est madame, faire si oui, bien tâcher, ça me fait plaisir. The fact that many of our students have problems with standard English at the end of their secondary school tenure seems to be a reflection of the absence of an important component of their learning situation. This component may very well be linked to the quality of exposure to English which the students receive. It is clear, therefore, that students must receive appropriate instructional support from the early years because this is important if they are to develop critical skills and positive attitudes towards language learning. Now, given the peculiarities of our language situation and those problems which I will which I've highlighted that, face, that are faced by our, our learners in the classroom. Again, it is my position that there needs to be a change in the philosophy, our general philosophy towards language instruction in St. Lucia. That change in philosophy to language situation, to language teaching, sorry, language instruction, has to take into account those practices which will enable our students to achieve competence in the standard variety. We must also look to the adoption of a language policy which is based on our learners developing full bilingualism in Quayon and Standard English. While traditionally the use of each of these languages has been limited to specific contexts, a language policy which seeks to equip and empower citizens with the two languages would result in a redefinition of their roles and context of use. In addition, out of all the alternatives for bilingual education, which Dennis Craig puts out, 
Full bilingualism is the option which would facilitate the realization of the most benefits for users of Solution Standard English and Puyol. If we move to adopting a clear language policy or language, a language policy, this would also aid in dispelling the negative attitudes towards Puyol and the vernacular, and by extension, would aid in establishing them as critical for instruction, especially in the language arts classroom. This has occurred in many countries. For example, significant gains have been made because of the adoption of a language policy for the Seychellois education system. And that happened because the, the Seychelles accorded official status to their Creole in 1979. One of the benefits was that larger numbers of students were afforded the opportunity to read and write in Creole, making them comparable to other children of the same age and intellectual development. In addition, improvements in student performance in other subject areas were noted. I would like to mention here that I am glad that there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel. I speak of the work of the OECS Commission through its early learners program, which is funded by USAID. The goal of that program is to improve the reading performance of children in the early grades in the six member states, in six member states of the OECS. One of the specific outputs of that program is the introduction of appropriate languages of instruction to teach reading in the early grades. And of course, one of their recommendations or the recommendations of the Early Learners Program is the adoption of clear language policies which will accommodate home languages or first languages or the mother tongue. We now move on to the general benefits of bilingualism. Going the way of instruction, which is aimed at developing full bilingualism in solution students, will be beneficial to them. For instance, a theory called the hypothesis, sorry, called the linguistic interdependence hypothesis proposes that second language skills are only superficially distinct from those of a first language, and that at some fundamental core, they are interdependent or are in actuality the same. Thus, once an ability or skill has been acquired in a first language, it does not have to be learned over or reacquired in a second language. In fact, skills may be transferred from one language to another. This occurs because literacy in a first language has a distinct advantage of benefiting from a language system which is well developed well before the onset of literacy instruction. The skills which can be transferred from a first language to a second language include learning to recognize that letters mean sounds, making sense of words as parts and wholes, syllables, onsets, rhymes, etc. Making sensible guesses at words giving a, given a storyline, understanding the meaning of sentences from a string of words, and moving from left to right across a page. You can transfer all of those things from a first language into a second. It is this thinking which forms the basis for arguments of the occurrence of cross-linguistic transfer of literacy skills in bilinguals as a benefit of bilingualism. For example, research by Simmons McDonald, which examined the biliteracy development of French Creole speakers, supports the position that literacy skills are transferable across languages. In her study, literacy in Creole was found to assist in reading development in English. The results from my own research on the influence of vernacular instruction 
on the literacy development of kindergarten, grade one, and grade two students of a selected school in St. Lucia yielded similar results. That research tested student performance in English and Quayle by measuring two literacy indicators, reading accuracy and phonological awareness in both languages. The results which I gathered for the grade one and grade two students who formed part of my sample. What I want to draw to your attention is that for each of the students, Gina, Harriet, Ivan, Oswald, Paul, Quentin, and Jaden, you will notice that I have an, an L1 and an L2. I had to, de it was necessary to determine whether or what the, each child's first language was and whether the children did have competence in a second code. Now, you may ask, how, how did I do that? to do three things. Because those grade one and grade two students had already been in, at school, some for one year, some for two, I interviewed their school principal, their class teachers, um, their parents or guardians, and the students themselves. So for the, 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 the teachers, teachers, the principals, principal, and the guardians, I would have asked questions, questions um, such, as, um, such as, what language do you speak, speak at home? home? What, what I, I, I needed to get, get in, um, um, information from all of those sources as a sort of triangulation, triangulation of the information. What was what most was important, important was, was collecting speech samples from each child. Mm -hmm. Once those speech samples were collected, then they had to be analyzed. And they were analyzed um, on the basis of the features of the language which the students used to answer the various questions that they were asked. So on the basis of a, a sort of an, an oral, they were asked oral questions, I recorded, transcribed, and looked at the features that they consistently used in order to determine whether a child spoke Quayle as a first language, whether the child spoke Slem as a first language, or whether the child was competent in both codes. Good? Now, some of the, and that, that was done before I applied any interventions or instructions in both, of, in both Quayle and English. At the end of the intervention, what I found was that in some instances, children will, and that is for when I tested reading accuracy, the ability to read text accurately. In some instances, students were able to show comparable gains in both languages after similar amounts of time had elapsed while others needed more time for comparable progress to occur in the two languages. For example, if you look here, you'll see that Gina was able to read at the independent level, and Ivan read at the independent level only after two weeks of instruction in each language, both in Quayle and in English. Now, the, the reading accuracy um, tool that I used measure the student's ability to read by, um, well, I had to assign them a score based on how they read. A score between 50 to 89% meant that the students were reading at a frustrational level, which means, boy, that, that whatever I gave them was frustrating them. Um, a score between 90 to 94% meant that the child did have some ability to read um, on his own, but needed assistance or scaffolding. And a score of between 95 and 99.5% meant that the child was able to read independently. Something else that came out of the research was that the students took different, amount, different amounts of time in order to respond to the instructional interventions to gain control of the reading material and to demonstrate an ability to read independently irrespective of whether I had classified them as monolingual speakers 
and you notice that some of the Gina and Harriet only spoke one lang language, so I classified them. They would, these would be the monolingual speakers. And Ivan, Oswald, Paul, Quentin, and Jane were all classified as bilingual. So whether they were monolingual or bilingual, what I found was that they still took different, amount, different amounts of time to gain control over the reading material that they were presented with. What does that suggest to you? We'll answer that question in a while. Additionally, all of those students who at the beginning of the study were classified as bilinguals, they had higher reading accuracy scores in Quayle than in English. These students are Ivan, Oswald, Paul, Quentin, and Jane. The interesting thing is that for all of those students, it was determined that their first language is Quayle, their whole language is Quayle, but it was their um, access to school which caused them to develop SLEV as a second variety. They, had, they, had, they spoke no English, or they, they were not able to use the English Creole variety before they got into the classroom. So it's no, it is no and note that when they were introduced to literacy skills in the language which is considered to be their first language, their reading scores were much higher than their scores for English reading. The performance of these students is therefore not surprising because it is consistent with the position that it is easier for a, for a learner to acquire literacy skills in the language which is known than in an unknown language. This is because whatever a child would have learned about his first language would, would contribute to his understanding of the second. In fact, four out of the five bilingual students were able to demonstrate the ability to read independently in Quayle within three weeks and less of Quayle instruction. amounts of time to exhibit the desired behaviors is an indication for the need for instructional planning to suit not only the diversity of the classroom with respect to the first language, but also to suit the diversity of the classroom in terms of ability and progress. Cannot we cannot continue, continue to, to instruct, instruct our, students our students in the language, in the language classroom, classroom with the with the sort of so the, the whole one size, one size fits all, all attitude. attitude. We have, we diff have different, different abilities. abilities. Students have students different, have first, different languages. first languages, so our, so our instruction has to, has to match the reality, the reality of, of the classroom. Okay, so now we another um, benefit of bilingualism or developing bilingualism is that bilingual, bilinguals have certain advantages on certain thinking dimensions, particularly in terms of divergent thinking, creativity, early metalinguistic awareness, and communicative sensitivity. And I'm trying to rush through here because we see a Royston and Femmel C. Let's go to the benefits which would be specific to the solution students. If we do take on this um, bilingual approach to instruction, our Quayle speakers would have the opportunity to gain literacy in their first language and would be able to transfer those literacy skills to standard English and to the learning of other languages. Those students who, for whom SLEV, or the English vernacular is a first language, 
We have the opportunity to understand the fundamental differences between the Creole, the code which they use, which they use, and the standard variety. And we'll also be able to develop bilingualism in Creole and English. For those students, and that is a small proportion, for those students who do come in with standard English as a first language, they, these students will also have the opportunity to become bilingual and bilingual in their first language and in Creole. And these students will also gain an appreciation of a language which is inex an inextricable part of what it means to be truly Saint-Lucia. What you will realize is that across the board, each, each speaker will be catered for. Each speaker would develop bilateracy and bilingualism. Each speaker would be better placed for learning of the learning of subsequent languages. Each speaker would gain a deeper appreciation for what it means to be Saint-Lucia. bilingual instruction, it is possible to, pro to choose from two options. The first option is a phased program, such as what obtains in the Seychelles, and in some instances in Haiti. Um, and I can think of one school in Haiti called ADECA, which is the Haiti Children's Academy, which I had the pleasure of visiting. Um, what, what happens at the school is that students are exposed to Creole instruction for the two years of elementary school or the two years of infant school. And for the years after that, after that, they're introduced to English and other languages. So they, they, it, is, it is ensured that they gain full literacy in their native Haitian Creole first, and then they are introduced to instruction in English and Spanish and French also. That's at Ameca specifically. The other option we have for approaching bilingual education is a concurrent pro program in which daily instruction would be divided for a set number of hours between Quail and English instruction. A concurrent program is suitable for our for the situation for the situations which we face in Saint Lucia. Either that we have homogeneous groups of maybe only English vernacular speakers, or homogeneous groups where you have Creole speakers, vernacular speakers, and standard English speakers. There is a tripartite model. There is a tripartite model which has been suggested by Simmons McDonald, and it makes it allows for the instruction of those three groups, as I said. For Creole speakers in the early grades, the focus would be on developing emergent literacy in Creole, and in the later grades, it would be on increasing literacy in English after they develop communicative competence in English. The other two models would speak up, which cater sorry, to speakers of Slev and Sedmusian Standard English would focus on developing lang academic language proficiency and communicative competence in standard English and Creole. This can be achieved by exposing children to a, to a, rich, lit, a rich literature source or rich literature from all three sources, which would be allow for the comparison of expressions in the three quotes, or what we call contrastive analysis. The text with SLEV, though, the English vernacular, would have to be used cautiously. Because if they are used inappropriately, what they may do inadvertently is reinforce slave structures instead of standard English structures. That is why there is a general um, suggestion from linguists that when you have situations where your vernacular is closely tied to the standard variety, these situations do not um, are not best suited for developing bilingual programs. There must be that difference. So if you look at Quayle and English, um, the, the developing bilingualism in this, these two languages would be 
more appropriate or less affordable goal. Additionally, the bilingual approach would lean heavily on constructivist activities, which would allow students to construct the grammars or syntax of the languages under study. So they, they construct on their own. They discover um, patterns in language on their own, as opposed to you telling them, you need to put the book here, you cannot have the, the verb, the, the, the adjective has to come after, no. Allow students to discover language on their own, to, to, to identify patterns, etc. The instructional activities will also have to foster collaborative learning, and should be part of a balanced approach to literacy instruction. Now, for any teachers here, you may be thinking that sounds like hard work. Yes, it will be, because it calls for differentiated instruction in the classroom. You decide what your students come in with. So, so the curriculum should not be so necessary. The cur curriculum, yes, will, lead, will guide in terms of content and suggested activities. But your students should drive instruction. Your, the, the characteristics that your students come in with should be taken into consideration and not totally ignored in order to, to instruct them. Thank you. At this point in time, we would like to invite Her Excellency Dame Colette Louise, who has been a champion of the Creole language, to aid in the discussion of this very riveting conversation that we've been having about our Creole language. We have a mic that will be in the background here. Please raise your hand and indicate if you would like to ask a question. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here this, this evening. And um, having listened to Dr. Deborah Dean, I'm sure that you are just itching to, to, to ask your questions, to, um, to indicate your positions on the use of Creole in the classroom. Now, I was happy at the end of, of, of perhaps Dr. Deprede should have started with explaining what the first part of the topic was, Piola um, Mabata. So that might have, you know, sort of given you a particular uh, perspective when, as you followed her, uh, her, her presentation. Right, so Piola Mabata. Uh, the Creole language is not an illegitimate child. I mean, I, when I was coming up, I was saying, uh, you know, if we translated the thing as is, and you know, to say uh, Creole is not a bastard, it would <laughs> sound a bit uh, rough. But of course, we, you know, we did it in here with, with um, registers of language and and we use the, um, the particular um, translation that best suits the, the circumstance. And you know, we're there in a, a formal intellectual setting. So, Creole, Creole language is not an illegitimate entity in our uh, language situation in St. Lucia and as such should be given its, its, proper, its proper place. So the question now, this, I mean, this debate is as old as the hills. And the question now is, 
having listened to Dr. Deprede, having followed her arguments and her presentations, has she swayed anybody? Uh, if we came in thinking that, you know, there we go again, uh, were we able to, to change our minds? Because the question was always, you know, where is the proof? You know, we said, you know, you must introduce um, first language in, in the school system because. But she has given the becauses. And so the question is, have we been swayed? And if we have been swayed, what is the next step? So I would like at this point to, to open the floor um, to, to ask um, anybody who wishes. Yes, Miss. Hi, good night. <laughs> Good night. Um, thank you both, and especially Dr. Depredin, for the presentation. As you mentioned, the problem is that we have so little research in those areas, but it is an argument. It's a discussion that's been going on for a very long time. And it's something that we're currently struggling with, because all children are growing up right now with, I think, the SLEV vision that you would note that you uh, mentioned. And the language is, to my mind, becoming more and more um, uh, what's the word? It, it's just becoming more bastardized in a sense. Um, and your recommendation at the end seems to be a very tall order. So my question is in the meantime, because I don't think we'll have that in schools anytime soon. So in the meantime, as parents, um, as family members, as solution citizens, are there any, is there anything that you can recommend that we do? I know you mentioned um, exposure to different literature, etc. Um, I don't think we have too much Creole literature for children in St. Lucia that we have access to. But in the meantime, are there any solutions, any actions that we as parents can take to try to develop that kind of bilingual among our children, our students. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I would suggest in the interim that we allow our, our children to converse with queer, all the queer speakers. Give them those experiences allow them to meet with individuals who are rich sources of information. There are, I'm just trying to remember the title, a series of books out of Dominica, which are very um, child friendly. They are available on Amazon. I, I can't remember the, the, the name off the top of my head, but that is an option if you want to expose children to um, for your, for your literature in the meantime. But as I said earlier, I am encouraged. I don't know if I'm blindly encouraged here. <laughs> but I am encouraged by the work of the Early Learners Program, simply because, I don't know, because there's a bigger organization, perhaps, um, championing the cause of developing or using the home language or a, a bigger organization which is who seeks to educate people on the importance of home language and the benefits that can be derived from using home language in the classroom. Um, now apart from the lack of materials, now you, you've touched on something which um, maybe the root or maybe a reason why there's this hesitance. One thing, to make a move to bilingual education will be a very costly thing. Costly in terms of developing materials. Costly in terms of curriculum changes. Costly in terms of training teachers to facilitate instruction. So that may, because like Her Excellency said, this conversation started before I engaged in my research. This conversation has been going on for a very long time. But we keep wondering why hasn't 
more, why, why more hasn't happened. And it could very well be because of those reasons. I have another reason that I'd like to throw out there, and it is a lack of political fortitude, along with all of those costs. I leave that there. Yes, and uh, just, be, just before I take um, the question, the, uh, Dr. Deborah is, Deborah is, is um, what was the word you use? I'm happy that uh, <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> encouraged. You know, and she gave the reason, one of the reasons why she's encouraged by the, the early leaders program. And the reason is maybe because it is being driven yes. from outside. Yes. Now that is an issue, and, and maybe for us that is a problem. Being driven from, a, from outside, from an organization outside of our, our own you know, circumstance. And, and it might, and it might, so therefore you might have to look at it, the question of sustainability. You know, if it is going to be driven at the end of the project cycle and at the end of the project life, what, where is the, um, the homegrown you know, enthusiasm to take the thing where it needs to go? So um, uh, I just thought I would uh, put that in because we always think, we don't like to be leaders, we always think that the thing is better than it comes from outside. But, um, yes, yes. Uh, oh, where, where is this? The bullet. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I was looking at this lady there, so yeah, I was wondering. I, I want to say that I really appreciate um, the presentation of the debut. I, I felt a, a delight, and I was able to feel also a kind of a faith and passion in your delivery. So I was encouraged by that. Yeah? <laughs> and having um, Dame Pullet as our chair, I think, is really you know, magnificent, really good, um, because she's such a champion of um, Creole has been, and she's attempted to bring a lot of dignity to the discourse, to the language, etc., cetera, um, in her former capacity. I w the question I was going to ask, incidentally, while I was waiting to ask it, you began answering it. Because I was going to ask, from your observation of St. Lucian society, your studies, um, what really is the problem? Why, after all this work that has been done, all this research, all this talk over so many years, why are we still at that point? I, I have become very impatient, and but I think now at this point, it's not about being impatient anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm fed up, you know. And um, so, I mean, it just brings me just to this one question. What is keeping us back, um, you know, from having, from taking that step where we engage writers, we have publications, we have the curriculum, we have the books in schools, we train the teachers, we have the methodologies, the pedagogies, whatever. Everything that, why, we, we know everything that has to be done, that has to be done, and yet we have reached a stage where we have new generations of teachers and intellectuals and researchers coming, and we still have not done it. Um, the Focus Earth Center burned down recently. Um, I remember when, you know, Walcott wrote The City's Death by Fire, he talked about fifths that were snapped like wire. Um, I wouldn't say that my faith is snapped like wire with the demise of the building of the FRC and our failure to implement a lot of the work that you have done, that Hazel Simmons McDonald professor has, has done before, and so many other people. Um, however, to me, at this juncture, I think that we just need now to focus on that, you know, what needs to be done now to bring it from here to in here, you know? Um, and uh, so, yes, your work, I know, takes us in that direction. If apart from what you've said, because I said you began answering it in terms of cost and so on, if um, perhaps Dame Willett can shed any light in terms of some additional obstacles that we need to get over, perhaps that can shed some light. 
Well, yes, I wasn't. I I wanted to 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 invite um, the, the gathering to to suggest reasons why we are still where we are. I mean, I, I, to ask me where or can be why are we where we are? You know, we are already converted. I'm sure there's people, uh, some among you. I mean, you came to the um, to this lecture to to find out again what is all this thing about. So perhaps you could could share with us some of you who have reservations. What is it that you think is impeding our our progress in uh, taking this? discussion uh, to the next level. Because it, 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 it is a discussion, and it, it keeps being a discussion, and we want to see some kind of implementation. So I think if you tell us why do you say, what are your particular reservations, and then we'll probably be able to, to move from there, because then I'm sure there are doubters still. <laughs> Yes, good doubters. Um, yes, um, right somebody has uh, the mic? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talking to the to the converted and all the we talking to all the, the choir boys. Yes, yes, yes. And everybody and knows Melinda and Alexander. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am encouraged. Yes, by um, your presentation, Miss um, Dr. Ketnebri, a former student. Uh, <laughs> and uh, encourage that more and more young people are studying linguistics and studying um, Creole at the university. Um, Something in your, I, I want to thank you for the, your findings, the university findings. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, there's an element in your findings that caught my attention and which um, has kind of prompted my intervention here. I agree with a lot of the remarks made concerning the language, the home language, affecting um, the student's performance in English and so on. And the element that caught my attention was the fact that the further exposure, the more they were exposed to instruction in English, mm -hmm. that the more their English deteriorated. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> As a teacher, that should be shocking. Yes. <laughs> really? As a language teacher too, I really, mm -hmm. really need to go back to the drawing board and see what is happening in the schools. Mm -hmm. So I am wondering, we're calling for Creole in schools, teaching Creole and all, Creole, Creole. And nobody's directing their attention at the teachers and instruction and training, teacher training in language. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, over 30 years um, when I came back from university, I was teaching English. We had started an English, um, English Teachers Association and we were looking at that. And um, training for teachers language, English language teachers was of paramount importance because we saw the, the, the language problems and so on. Um, but that was not addressed. And how many years later, it is for me the biggest source of the deterioration in the English performance of the students today. We have not looked at improving the training of our language teachers. The teachers training college has to take a big look at that. And I'm very serious when I say that. Several attempts, several comments made to the, the teachers, teachers college, teacher training, where Creole needed to be taken into consideration, where they, um, how teachers were trained in language. It wasn't simply a matter of just teaching English as a foreign language, or teaching English as a second language. That was all that we needed to do. We had to look at also the teacher's language themselves, how the teachers themselves speak. Mm -hmm. 
the teacher, as you said, the children learn in a formal learning situation has a big effect on the children. How they speak, they speak, they speak like the teacher. And, and, and uh, the, what they pick up in school. A lot of my creoles I learned to, in school, eh? I, I think in school, not so much at home. But um, if the teacher herself has not mastered the standard English herself, and has mastered techniques of teaching um, English that are effective, um, it is highly unlikely that she will be doing a good job at teaching English, um, standard English, the way we want it to be taught so that students can be speaking it effectively. I see that also, not just in the English and the Creole here, but it's also in Haiti, also with the French. The, the, the teachers who speak Haitian Creole and speaking and teaching, teaching, they try to teach it to French in Haiti. So it's a common thing. The teachers are, are a big source of what is, what kind of performance you're going to get out of the children that she's teaching. And I see it in French language too, teaching French. If the teacher herself has not mastered the French language, the phonetics, the, 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 the production, the children are going to suffer. You're not going to get a perfectly speak, a teacher, teach a, a child who's speaking the English or the standard English you want if her teacher is not doing a good job and is not speaking a, a, a level of language that is required to, to get that performance. Yeah. Um, we just like to encourage everybody to stand as you deliver for the sake of our online audience as well. Okay, thank you. Good night. My name is Catherine Maitland. I'm a Peace Corps volunteer at Sufre Infant. So I'm, I'm happy to know that you were a master teacher last year. Um, and so what I'm wondering, because I see what you're talking about happening in the classroom every single day. And my position as a Peace Corps volunteer is to work with the teachers to help the kids learn better English. And so it's a struggle that I've had since I've come here to really work with the teachers in, in providing interactive literacy instruction and differentiated literacy instruction. So what I, what I also see with, um, in the classroom and in the schools is that the teachers will do kind of what's prescribed to them, you know? What the ministry says they have to do. Okay, this is what my schedule is. I have to teach grammar here, then I have to teach spelling, then I have to teach reading comprehension. Let me, see, let me look at, at the curriculum for term two. Okay, I need to teach these topics in reading comprehension. Let me do this for week one. Let me do this for week two. So what I see, or what I think that really has to happen in order, like has been talked about previously, is that we have to, we have to work with the ministry to see how are we going to, not just fit it in like we fit all these other things in, but how are, how are we going to make this a big thing? And maybe we have to take some things out that aren't as important or we can put them in later. But I think, you know, especially in those lower grades in infant school, like has been talked about. So what I'm wondering is if there's any movement that you're part of or people that you know um, towards speaking with the ministry to go in that direction. Um, and if you're working with ELP, because I'm very familiar with ELP as well. And um, I've been to many ELP workshops. And the only thing that has really been talked about with Creole in the classroom is just saying, you know, having the kids maybe say a sentence, say what they're thinking in Creole, and then say, okay, now let's say it in standard English, and let's write it in standard English, which is better than just saying everything in standard English, of course. But if, as you're talking about, having more, having maybe half the time in Creole, and then half the time in standard English. So that's one of my questions, and then my other question is, um, since we're, I'm um, going off of what you were saying. Since we're at the university or at the college right now, I was wondering if there's any education professors here um, or if there's any movement towards um, having student teachers use Creole in the classroom um, and you know, really teaching a class about that because there's, uh, there's actually three student teachers from Sir Arthur Lewis at, student, at Sufre Infant right now. And the lessons that they're doing are so amazing. These, the kids are running around the classroom. They're acting like kids. They're not just sitting down at a desk for, you know, hours during the day. And, you know, they're using positive behavior. So I really see that with the teachers that come out of this college, they can really start to influence what's going on at the schools that we have here. So those, those are my two questions for you. Uh, 
Um, yes, if you could go ahead and answer the question. Um, afterwards, I would just read one of our online comments and then go over to the next in house question. Thank you for that comment about the, the student teachers. I'm happy to hear that. To hear that. Um, the, the current program that the student teachers follow does make them aware of the language situation and does suggest activities for dealing with um, you know, our language situation. But again, exposing teachers to the peculiarities of the language situation is not enough. The current program does not, in my opinion, equip them um, adequately. What I can speak of is the move, Madam VP, if I may, by the college, by the South Louis Community College to design new programs which would prepare teachers to function in a bilingual context. We are in the process of designing a Quayol course, a content course, which would teach teachers Quayol, and also a methods course, which would train teachers, or methods courses, which would train teachers to function in a bilingual context. So we, 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 we recognize our responsibility as a training institution, and we have taken up the challenge. Um, before we go on to the next question, we will hear that we just read a uh, comment from our online audience. Um, get with me. Although the push for home language under the early learners program is happening with the assistance of an outside entity, the work itself is being done by St. Lucians. Consultations were conducted with groups of St. Lucians and the literary coaches or coordinators in the eight school districts are the ones who have joined the fight for appreciation for home language. They are the ones in the schools encouraging teachers to appreciate the value of the language with students, with which students come into the schools. Teachers are coming to appreciate that our children already are literate in their home language and they are now eager to find out how they can use students, students' home language to effectively teach them another language. The adoption of the national language policy would go a long way in helping the education system to establish definite strategies for using all our languages. We are ready to move once that language policy is adopted, and French Creole is an official language. That comes from Angel Catlin. Sorry, I'm supposed to be close, but I'm just dying. I'm so inspired by what you're saying. So one of the things children who's a strong advocate of reading every single night and reading a variety of different books. Where are my Creole children's books for me to read for them? I go to Barbados and I go to a library, I go to a bookstore and I'm able to buy a variety of books about cricket, about folklore, children's books. Next month is reading month. And at various schools, there will be reading out loud sessions for children. How many of the schools would be reading Creole children's books? Now, I don't want to put fire on my friend, but I have a friend who writes children's books, and they're being translated into Spanish and French. Are they being translated into Creole? So at home, if I can find the resources and start at home to show my boys the relevance and the importance of Creole in reading, then afterwards, when they come to school, they are more open to that. I think that we have to start from the cradle with the Creole language, not in the schools. This is an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Now you're forcing it down their throats. But from home, they know that I, have, I can read a Spanish textbook to them. I can read Dr. Seuss in Spanish now, Dr. Seuss in French. Why are we not translating these children books into our Creole language to show them the importance? That's where I would start. That's where I would put the value. In starting, so Dawn, that's pressure on you. The next book we translate of Peanut is going to be in Creole. Or, or how, um, about, how about Dr. Suse? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, may I just say something here? It is, we do recognize that there's a dearth of, of children's literature in, in Quayle. One suggestion, one way I think we can go is to develop literature through the schools. And I'll, I'll explain how. It was something we saw in Haiti. 
when um, the schools started with um, instru instruction in Haitian Creole, they faced the same problem. There, was, there were no children's books. So what, what did they come up with? As part of instruction, the children are creating their books. The children who are fluent in Creole are putting their thoughts down. So they are not only writing the stories, they are putting in the accompanying pictures for those stories, and they are publishing them. So once the children publish, these texts can be shared with the schools, and they become resource material. That is one way to it. And it's also not quite, quite, quite fair to say that we don't have any children's books. I mean, yeah, you have to start somewhere. We do have a series. Uh, yes, I'll try to uh, with Michael Walker and, and started, we've read it, the folk tales which which um, we would normally have our grandmother, you know, say to us. So so these are a, um, these are a, well, I would say they are available, but they were developed. And but I, I think it was really lack of 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 interest. Well, I have to admit, it's a few years ago. Lack of interest in in in, in pushing that initiative that um, you know resulted in you know the disbandment of the of the publishing house. And, but uh, I do I do agree with you that there needs to be you know sort of more more and not just for children but for everybody but generally for the teachers. Mind you, I agree with Linda. She spoke as far as English is concerned. But I mean, to be honest, if a miracle happened tomorrow and we were told, yes, we could start teaching Creole in schools, you would have a problem. I mean, the teachers themselves, a lot of them don't speak. Now I'm talking about Creole. I mean, that's what I'm saying. If there was a miracle and I said, okay, the ministry or we have a language policy as of the coming academic year, um, we could start teaching Creole in schools. The question would then be who? Who? So that is it's not so the Creole as I say is not just, you know, um, well, yes, the teachers, but of course, the teachers come to a, an institution with a, a curriculum. And we've, we, we really do have to look, apart from just teaching um, um, the, the Creole, also have Creole studies, for example, you know? And then the, the Creole studies does not necessarily have to be only English. And sorry, not only language, you know? Uh, at, the, at the tertiary level. So, to, get good persons, you know, um, infused with the whole Creole experience. And language is just simply one of these, you know, um, aspects of, of Creole. So, I think it's the, uh, oh. Epifana Lewis, um, just more of a comment um, more than anything else. Um, with regards to what Lindy Ann said um, in terms of the teachers being trained, I think we have an even bigger problem when it comes to the impact of technology on the way that our students speak or write, rather. Because in the classroom, I sometimes communicate with my students via WhatsApp. And <laughs> it's so difficult to get them to write properly. You, they, they, for, for lack of a better, they've unlearned everything that they have been taught. So you find people a simple, like you have the word that, D-A-T. Some of them just change a complete word and put in their own words. Now you have that, in addition to have that the issue with the, 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 the teachers, but that's a, an even bigger problem because now you find that the English language is de deteriorating, they're not, they're not learning 
They're learning, it's a new language they're coming up with. Mm. It is. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So we have, we have some already. We have one done and we have another one here. And then we take one from online and then we start to kind of simmer down. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I am a little surprised by some of the things I'm hearing at this time. Um, I think we need to use the technology um, because I, I, there was a time when it was necessary to have a publishing house to publish your, your storybooks and so on. I think the idea in Haiti where persons are after, the children are actually writing and putting it on and so on, I think that that, that is the way to go. But I wanted to make a, a, a more fundamental point, actually. And it had to do with some of the reasons, or at least one reason, that I am not very optimistic that we will make a big change. I say this because we have been speaking um, constructivism for some time now. In fact, we started it, it first came about um, when we were looking at mathematics. The idea being that we ought not to just teach the children how to do certain things, um, addition, multiplication, and so on, but that what we really ought to do is to provide them with the experiences that will allow them to develop, as you said, the, 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 understand the structures and come up with the structures and principles. However, I believe that the education system in St. Lucia is not particularly geared towards being equitable. Our education system is fundamentally built on an equality system rather than an equitable system. So that we generally provide all the children with a one size fits all. And that is a fundamental structure of the, of the education system. Common entrance, minimum standards, all of these are institutions which continue the method of equity, of, of equality, rather than equity. And unless we understand that that, that, that is the paradigm which underpins our education system, all of what we're doing here is not. A fundamental thing, and I will go to mathematics because I can talk mathematics more than languages. A fundamental thing like removing out of the education system the matter of dividing one fraction by another. We cannot remove that out of the curriculum even after so many years of being metric. When was the last time any one of you had to divide one fraction by another fraction? In any event, a calculator can do that much quicker than any one of you can. And each of us would have a calculator at least in our phone. So why are we not, why are we not modifying the education system to suit what is actually happening? I believe, quite frankly, that it is because there is a certain class of persons who benefit from that system and they maintain that system because they want to maintain their advantage. Okay, so we go, I think it's Don and him and then we go to the online. Okay, um, so may I say something? Yes, yeah, sure. And let's just uh, yeah, let's comments, questions. Let's get to it. To it. Bring to the point. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Mr. Dolo made this comment about the the education system in Saint Lucia. I will stand by saying that we we need to answer one question: What is the purpose of education? Why are we educating our students? To what ends? And that is why I mentioned a need for, what is our philosophy for educating our students? What do we want to gain out of that education? And until we have a curriculum which is properly grounded in a solid philosophy, 
in solid beliefs for the individuals that we want to develop for this country, then things we will continue to spin top in mud. Very interesting discussion. I somehow got the impression that you ended when the time was up and you had more to go. Um, three things. One, Tracy, I will take on the challenge. Yes, I will put peanuts in Creole once I get someone to work with to, to, to get it in Creole. Um, secondly, I don't know if you are aware that the Ministry of Education this year is doing a curricular review. And next year, they are doing a content review. At least that's the information I've been given. And so, I don't know if the college will be in a position to engage the ministry on a lot of topics. Come forward. Yes. Okay. Wow, front and center. That that better? I can I can go ahead now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was saying the Ministry of Education is doing a curricular review this year and a content review next year. And so the college may, be, may want to engage with the ministry and put forward a lot of what we have been discussing and some of your presentation. What I really wanted to say is that there's a general, we talk about, I learned a phrase recently called code switching. I'm not a linguist, but I learned, the, and I, you didn't, it didn't come up. And what's interesting is that you have to have a degree of fluency in a language to do the code switching. And because of the code switching and our, and our familiarity and proficiency in the Creole and the English, I perceive a lot of code switching, which is eroding the Creole. Because my mother, who is in her 80s, has always said to me, you, don't, you cannot speak Creole. And I always say to her, well, if I get lost somewhere in St. Lucia and I can ask for directions so when I can understand the directions, I speak Creole. But I'm perceiving, you had people like, uh, like Travis's father, my mother, um, St. Clair Daniel, um, um, Fred Clark. These people were proficient in standard English and standard Creole, and never the two shall mix. When my mother speaks Creole to me, she speaks Creole. There is no English in the sentence. When my mother is speaking English, she speaks English. There is no Creole in the English. So what is happening to us now that we have this bleeding into the two, which seems to be acceptable? And because I've been raised in a household with the two languages, are spoke as and they are given the respect and the distinction of being languages that we as a society are accepting the hybridness for lack of a better word of what is happening and and I bring it up because you say about the policy on the language the policy on language needs to enforce and reinforce that Creole is a language and English has no place in it because there are words for it so I wanted to put that on the table for you. It, it comes back to a question of competence in, in the languages. In the languages. Um, individuals who are fully competent do not mix, who are, who are truly balanced bilinguals. There are degrees of bilingualism. A truly balanced bilingual will not have to um, reach tap into another language to express himself in, in one. So there are, we do recognize that there are solutions who, because of deficiency, who have a certain level of competence in Quayle, but because of deficiencies, in, especially the, the, the switching is because, to, is because of vocabulary needs. They aren't familiar with certain words in Quayle and will tap into English to fill the gaps. It goes, it's, it's by the level of the degrees of bilingualism.
Imo. Imo me tu. You might <laughs> I made this point purposefully because in your presentation, as eloquently as you have done it tonight, look at what's happened. So many people have spoken and asked questions. Not one person have said anything of asked a question in Creole. I am 50. I, I, I will be 50. In 1988, Dame Pulit Rizzi was my principal. And she started this discussion at A Level College about Creole. Today, we have effectively three St. Lucia's. Shop on the North, the Caspis Basin, and the South. You ask anybody 30 years and younger from the North, or I dare say, the Caspis Basin, where is Viewfort? Where is Clark Street in Viewfort? Anyone here? Where is Clark Street in Viewfort? And they, have, and they have no idea where Clark Street is in Viewfort. Okay? So, it goes back to essentially what has been important for us in our development. Now, you know somebody very well who is very dear to me. And if you ask that question, which you asked tonight about mother tongue, my wife, she will have no idea what you're talking about because she grew up in a multilingual society. There's no such thing as mother tongue. At home, she speaks one language to her father, a different language to her mother, which is not the language that we speak in St. Lucia. Take Finland. The Finnish are the only people who speak Finnish. No one else does. Yet, they have the best education system by far in the world. So I want to applaud tonight the, the bravery of Lindy, who in 1987, 1988, taught one boy French. In fact, he came from St. Mary's College, my best friend, as it happened at the time. He was the only person to do French in our year. Only person, only French student, only male French student who came to um, A-level college. My dear, I think Imo, Criola, Imo. And to use Haiti as an example, I don't think it's very convincing. Because today, when we look at successful societies, we're not looking at Haiti as a successful society. I'm afraid we're not. I've just come from Mumbai. I've just come from Mumbai. And those guys on the streets, those young kids on the street, whose first language is not English, it's Hindi or whatever the dialect is in Mumbai, can face me in English when they, the moment they hear my accent or my, my response to them in whatever language. They have no formal learning. Last week, week before, we had the global prize for teachers in education, or teachers, $1 million. When you look, and you can Google it, you look at the top 40 candidates from around the world, not one from the Caribbean, not one. And they came from everywhere. And incidentally, the teacher who won the prize was a teacher who augmented the curriculum and herself recognizing that in her community, there were Brent in London, 130 languages were spoken. She taught herself 35 languages so that she could get to communicate 
basically conversationally with the parents of her children. Because importantly, the kids are important. The education of the kids are important and not the teacher. And that's why I want to applaud what Lindy said tonight. Because she's done something very brave. Standing up among teachers and telling them that you don't get it right and you need to do differently. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> okay, so we have a comment from online. You want to re re would you like to respond to? Can I? Online. Um, the first is from Dawson Ragunanan, who is actually now the um, acting deputy chief for instruction from the ministry. And he says that the problem is that we don't have enough pioneers for change. Also, our buy in strategies must target all sectors of the country. So this, I guess he's, it's not just about education or educators. Everybody must buy into that. And we have an additional comment from Jennifer Raphael who says, each one of us can begin the movement. We St. Lucians must teach our children Creole, not just the language, but the culture. And before we, we move to Mr. Williams, I just want to share an experience that I had. If the Creole is really dead, and, and we're speaking about the language Creole, I don't know if we're looking at all of the influences. So this week, in a communication studies class, we were discussing the varieties of language. And a student said to me, um, her family spent a lot of time in either England or Canada. So her older siblings were born there, and they speak standard English for the most part. She was raised in St. Lucia and she says there's an issue here and she speaks with an accent although she lives here because of the influence. She said her sisters get so upset with her because she does not know how to use borrow and lend. <laughs> and she told me Miss it's because we only have one word in Creole. She doesn't speak Creole. But she does not know how to use borrow and she has difficulty. And it's something that we see in the schools. So how, we do, how do we address situations like that, where the students may not be Quayle speakers, but hear how the, the, the Quayle influences their ability to speak English? When we, when we look at the structure of SLIM, um, that is why, okay, that's why we say that this variety is heavily influenced by Quayon structure. Because I, I was just trying to figure out, okay, what's the word you're talking about? Say Quayte Quay. When Quayte is that, when Quayte is it's the same word. Um, what we have happening in the English vernacular is a lot of carryover. So we have the carryover of the structural components and some vocabulary also of quail into our English production. And that, that is why um, we do we look at it as a Creole influence variety. Okay. Good night everybody. Thank you very much, Doc. Sorry I was at another meeting someday. Uh, Mr. Dolo, I'm going to take you to task about this technology change. Uh, my wife used to read for my children when they were still breastfeeding. So through all our children, they learned reading, the sounds of reading, when they were just babies at the breast. And she continued teaching and reading to them as they grew up. So reading was an integral part. That's the first one. And speaking as a principal of a secondary school, in the 1970s. My catchment area was from Monrepo to Choiselle. So that's background Creole students. I told the students, you're quite free to speak Creole because I can understand Creole, so you can't say something I don't understand. So that was, you're quite free to speak all the Creole you want, but I want to speak good Creole. The first thing about the teaching here is that our teachers of English, I'm very disturbed and upset. If they don't speak the language properly, how can they teach it? Even from teachers' college, when it was up here, you had the young teachers talking. My God, they can't talk English properly. So that's a problem. 
The other problem is the second language teaching. I had a member of my staff who did second language teaching. That's people whose first language was not French. I tried to persuade the ministry. City and guilds used to offer a program in second language teaching. I tried to persuade them to get that because most of the kids, their background were in Creole. You come from the area that they came from. They did. So what I did, additionally, I built a library for the students. Best library after Sir Arthur in any secondary school here. Of course, they look at me as a pretty radical headmaster. We had a compulsory one hour reading lesson. You come to the classroom, I don't want to see anything, you have to have something to read. So you force them to read while they're in the classroom. The teachers did not separate the language from the literature. It was all language we were teaching, we were speaking, and so together. So that went well. And so this continual accent on having the students to read. You got the books to them, you gave them the time in the classroom to do it. So then they did well. The only school that did better than us was a convent for a short while. Someone mentioned about teaching material. Mr. Michael Walker of Musings. He's prepared a lot of material in Creole. The ministry never bothered you. At his own expense, he prepared the material. It's still sitting there somewhere. And it's produced and it's ignored. Mr. Levine, um, what's the name there? Creola, Creola Pamo. Ipamo Pies. People who have not had a good background in education, you had them speak in English, but they have re-lexified the Creole. The, the words and sounds are English, but my God is Creole they're speaking. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Of course, we have all been very much invigorated, inspired, and we want to talk some more. So hopefully the discussion does not end here, but as we walk out the doors, we continue to talk about the future of our education in St. Lucia and what our philosophy behind it really is. Correct? Um, would you ladies like to end with anything? Well, yes, I was going to say, we are forgotten the moderator. So, I just, so, uh, you know, just to round up, I mean, the, the, the key um, phrase, if you want, to, for today's lecture was really, we're not my bad time. We are not an illegitimate child. In our, you know, in, the, in our linguistic landscape. Uh, the question is, um, after today's um, this evening's lecture, are we are we convinced? Have we been encouraged? Um, and the question now is, as as um, Mrs. George said, when we leave here, what next? The whole question of language policy has been, you know, um, banded about. You know, we just have to, at some point, somebody has to take their, their a bull by the horn, the proverbial bull by the proverbial horn, and get, get to. A while ago, uh, the, the, um, the peace talk, uh, one of the ask, um, you know, whether the, the, the college would be interested, I'm a paraphrasing her, would be interested in working with the ministry. And I found it a bit odd if you say, you know, the, the institution that's, that's training the teacher would be so not involved in this curriculum review or content review that the question is whether the institution would be partnering with the ministry. Um, and perhaps that is one of our, of our problems with, with, with the system, with the education system, that is. But having said all this, I would like to, to thank you for, for this evening's discussion. I hope it has been of some news. And perhaps out of this, Again, should come uh, a group of interested. Um, you don't have to be a teacher or an educator, 
But you know, to come together and start the door moving as far as putting in place the, the, the Creole lexicon that we would need when the bell rings for the introduction of Creole in schools. So, and it's also very expensive, you know. I mean, in such a they didn't spend five years putting the thing together. They did it year by year. They decided that that it was going to be the first year they worked on year one and introduced it. The next year, they worked, well, during the, that year one, they worked for year two, you know? I always think that our problem, our challenge, our problem here, and I don't take a lot of time, but I, I figure out that I understand. <laughs> <laughs> it's that, you know, we really, for us, it is the grand design or nothing. I mean, the idea of doing things incrementally, you know, doesn't sit well with us. We want a big picture, we want to dot every I and cross every T, and when we're satisfied, then we want to implement. But, um, but we need to start somewhere. We so. appreciate you very much. We appreciate that, correct? Thank you very much. Her Excellency will now present a gift of appreciation to Dr. Depardine. Yes, Dr. Depardine is um, one of the, the latest in the generation of Creole, uh, um, I didn't say apologies. But, <laughs> but that the, the younger generation, you know, people like myself, uh, Nubea, I'm not quite sure about um, Dr. Isaac, whether she says she's a Nubea, but we have um, new persons like, like Dr. Deppoli coming in, showing that empty So we want to thank you for, uh, for the research that you've done. We want to thank you for sharing it with us. And let's hope that people have been so Enthused that they've been coming to you and say, Where do we start? Aloysius R.C. Boys Infant School. 
At the same Teachers College, she first served as a mathematics tutor from 1963 and subsequently principal from 1975 to 1982, the first St. Lucian woman to hold this post. Lady Thomas was the holder of a master's degree in education from the University of Ottawa in Canada and fellow of the College of Preceptors, the first St. Lucian to obtain this professional diploma. She penned the groundbreaking History of Education in St. Lucia between 1824 and 1944 as a requirement for this qualification. She devoted much time to the development of curriculum material in mathematics, planning workshops and vacation courses for teachers. Post her retirement, Lady Thomas continued to show interest in the South Wales Community College and was an avid supporter of the college's activities. In her younger years, she would have been at such an event. Lady Thomas was the wife of former principal of the college and composer of St. Lucia's national anthem, Sir Lady Thomas. The South Wales Community College celebrates the life of an outstanding educator of good repute who served the education sector with distinction. The college extends condolences to Sir Lydian Thomas and her family and friends. So that's the end of our tribute to Lady Thomas. May she rest in peace. And just one more thing before I leave. Just um, an advertisement for one of our departments here, our food and beverage students, the year two students, who will be graduating very soon or ending their course, usually put on an end of year event. And this year they have coined it Lucian Twist Parade Dinner. So you are invited on April 27th to be part of that dinner at the Lefort restaurant, which is the training ground for our students. It begins at 6 p.m. and the tickets cost only $120 for a six-course dinner. So please, you can contact the Division of Technical Education and Management Studies for your purchase of tickets. Thank you so much. Back to your mistress of ceremonies. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity for the vote of thanks. The Office of the Vice Principal, we would like to thank Dr. Merle St. Clair Geese, the Vice Principal, Ms. Dora Henry of the same office, the Uprising Committee members, Mr. Vladimir Lucia, the Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Royston Emanuel, Mr. Michael Hart, Mrs. Verna May Louise, Ms. Natalie Jolene Fannis, and when it's nice, you say it twice, Miss Dora Henry. <laughs> Our partners, of course, we'd like to thank Phil, OECS, Valeri, Menage to our wines, which we're going to be enjoying after when we invite you all to refreshments. ITS coordinator, Mr. Crispin Blass. AV technician, Mr. Garvin McDonald. Mr. Sean Field, Mexicon, and of course you, our audience in-house and our audience online. We thank you very much for engaging us this evening, for your enthusiasm, for your comments, for everything, for coming out and being with us. We thank you so much for being here. As Ms. Jolie Fanta said the last time, this is a date that we have every first Wednesday of the month, we meet here to have an intellectual conversation discourse. You can also join us online at SALCC TV. So please join us there. And if you want to repeat the lecture, show it to your friends, share it. Then you can also find us on SALCC TV. Thank you. Closing remarks. As a college, we hope that we are achieving our goal to help faculty, researchers, and experts in their field to share their research and innovation to support the development of the mind of the society. Today, Google celebrates Maya Angelou's 19th birthday with an incredible Google Doodle. Anybody saw that? What did I say? 90th. Yes. I was actually at her 80th birthday party. I was privileged to have that um, honor. So for her 90th birthday, they did an incredible Google uh, Doodle. 
Once you click on the doodle, we hear Maya Angelou reciting her famous poem, Still I Rise. So this morning, when I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I said to myself, we're doing uprising here at Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. And here Maya Angelou is speaking to me with this poem, Still I Rise. Sir Arthur Lewis Community College is trying to become a university college. We are writing our AD courses, our associate degree courses. We are, we are facing financial difficulty. We are facing many difficulties, but we continue to rise. And this uprising this evening epitomizes that, that although FRC, no matter, you can't, you can't tear us down, still we rise. You may write us down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may troll the very dirt, but SALCC will always rise. And we thank you, Dr. Deborah Lynn, for reminding us that with our Creole language, nobody can take that away from us. It will continue to rise. We are an amazing institution. We thank you for coming. SALCC will rise, and we see you for the next time for the uprising. Have a good evening.